Okay, so we are back here again for our second session with Genevieve Gagnard. We started off with the series talking about your origin story and how your career has evolved, uh, the beginnings, the startings, and here we are re really excited about talking about your practice. I love that you put up on the screen um, an image of your work and I'm sure you're gonna tell us a little bit about it. But um, first of all, Genevieve, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. I mean, the sun's out today, so it's, you know, uh, a nice switch up from the past few days of like snow mixed with rain and clouds. So, you know, right? I'm just appreciating the sunlight coming in my window. You notice I'm in my house today. I'm not in my car. <laughs> it's, I've got you know? mixed feelings about That's that. I miss, I miss the car, but I, I'm happy you're probably a little bit more comfortable, but um, you might have to talk about switching that back up, but I'm glad, Unless I'm glad. The did, there won't be a train going by, there won't be cars <laughs> driving by, so I'll be able to focus a little bit. <laughs> but it's those little things that made it so special, but again, no matter where you are, we're really happy to have you here, and um I think, you know, in the interest of time, we'll just dive right into it. So, you know, like I said we could talk a lot about your practice. Um, and so let's devote as much time as possible to that. One of the things that um, I think most people are really interested in is, you know, as an artist, when we talk about the word practice and what that means, if you, when you think of that for yourself, could you describe to us what your practice is or what it's like for you? In terms of like my starting point and like where I get my ideas? Well, I think or when, we, when I think about, else? yeah, when I, when I think about practice, you know, when you describe it, you have been fortunate enough to have, you know, project after project, like always busy, right? Some artists don't have that for whatever reasons. And I'm sure that definitely colors how you actually work in the studio, what you do, how you do it. Is it about deadlines? All those sorts of things. Is it unique to you or do you feel you're very similar to other artists? Um, how would you describe your practice in that way? Yeah. So like you said, I have, you know, been fortunate enough to have um, a pretty steady kind of flow of shows coming in. So, you know, having a deadline is like a huge thing for me. But the image I have on the screen is my thesis show from Yale. So you're kind of getting a sense of like how I worked like right out from you know the end of grad school right uh, but I think it's I'm I kind of work in a way where I might have gone like really hard on a project and like really focused on it and then I might not step foot in the studio until I've kind of regrouped or you know I need to find new things that in, are inspiring me because I'm often like inspired by like what's happening in the moment you know mm -hmm. um what's relevant now even though i use materials from the past often um but i think just kind of setting goals even if you don't have a specific deadline for a, a work or a body of work um it's helpful to kind of work in those. I, I often will say that like, I hate deadlines and love deadlines at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, even when I'm not physically working, like in, in the studio, I think I'm, I'm still creating, like I'm, I'm working up here, you know, like I'm kind of right. making sense of things or, you know, um, kind of just filtering through ideas and concepts and materials that I might want to use. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do you, do you find when you're creating a body of work to meet a deadline, you know, you know what the, what the idea, and I'll ask you a little bit more, I think, kind of delve in more to you, to how you actually develop concept, concepts. But 
just in terms of um, like mechanics, are you the type that in your mind you already see what the finished product is going to look like in terms of individual pieces and installation and how it all works together? Or is it kind mm -hmm. of organic, not necessarily sequential, but things kind of riff off of something else um, when you're working? So like, yeah, just in terms of maybe like your organization, how, how does that work for you? So it, it depends on what medium I'm working in. Okay. Um, so, and often if there is a show that I'm like working towards, um, there are often themes or reasons why they've invited me to be part of something, you know? Right. So that helps to kind of, at least as a starting point of where I want to like develop the full concept of it. But um, I kind of like the, with the photographs, I usually would work on the photographs because first, because um, I, it's kind of like a checklist for me to kind of get the photographs done and out of the way. And I feel like, because the photographs are kind of what maybe I'm known for, or like what I went to school for, or that was my focus in photography. Mm -hmm. But as you can see here in this image, like the end result was quite a number of things. Right. Um, but I worked on them at separate times, you know? So okay. it's good for me to kind of compartmentalize, like, okay, I did the photographs and those, those said this much. And so now to expand the story, I'm going to um, maybe work on the collage works. And those are gonna, you know, touch on the things that maybe the installation won't say, or the, you know, so it's kind of like that. I don't see them, like I work on them separately, but I, as more work gets done, like you start to see like the through lines. And, you know, often I'll, try and have like a color palette or, you know, the specific wallpapers that I'm going to work with just to give me like a rough idea. But over time, I feel like I've developed a certain like color palette and materials that start to really like speak specifically to my practice right. and my language. Right. Yeah. So that's interesting. So you, you tapped, you, you kind of tapped on that situation in which you may have gone to school to study something specific within a different within a specific medium but then you find that you enjoy working in other mediums and i wonder do you ever find or you know i i definitely can see other artists having experienced this but do you find that there are certain ways in which artists can, and I don't know if this is the case for you, but they can be pigeonholed or defined by the medium in which they were first recognized for or acknowledged for. And for you, working in several mediums, how, how, how have you managed that for yourself? Has that been challenging? How has it worked for you? What, yeah. What for you? I mean, as you can see in this image, I, I was experiment. I feel like this is, these are works from my course of time at Yale. So the things that really stuck with me that worked, you know, right. um, and it was kind of important for me to bring them all together, mm -hmm. but, um, even in my, my crits at Yale, you know, the, the bottom row of shoes is what you're seeing there, um, which were presented on individual pedestals. And it was kind of like, they didn't know what to think of me. You know, I'm presenting to a panelist of photographers. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the comments that got to me was like, oh, so you're interested in fashion. And I was like, no, this is not, you know, like, it was too outside of the box of photography, obviously. Um, but it was crucial. It was a crucial like step for me to get away from being pigeonholed as working very similarly to Cindy Sherman. 
Mm. So I was just kind of looking to show how do I rep like represent a character when you remove me, the artist or the fig, the, the, the subject of the photograph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's, that was kind of what the shoes were about. Okay. Um, but then that kind of gold piece that you're seeing is a collage mostly with like cut out words. Um, there's some photoshopped images of Beyonce's body and I put my head on her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so like those are things that I would put up in a crit and they would just be like, what are you doing? Do you know? Right. And I didn't necessarily let it like, like disturb, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, discourage me from like creating work about the same, like these themes. Cause I feel like these are all about like race and trying to figure out your identity and where you fit in the world. Like, and that's still very much my theme. Um, and I think when I, when you ask me about being pigeonholed, it, it instantly makes me think about how it is to be pigeonholed as a person and how, you know, I'm often pigeonholed as white, but I don't identify as that. And that's part of my story. You see a portrait of my parents there um, in this, in this um, installation. So I guess I've built up a tough enough skin to know that that's going to happen, but not let it keep me from doing what I want to do. Whether right. I've focused in like a specific medium, like I haven't mastered collage or, you know, whatever, or installation, but um, I'm able to manipulate the materials to say what I need them to say. So it sounds like you felt like beyond the photography, like this was a conscious choice to kind of define you and your practice, but also all of this was out of interest, but they're also vehicles for you to do what maybe you thought couldn't be done with only photography too, because I think, you know, that's important to understand if I'm right. Yeah, I appreciate and acknowledge the limitations of certain, or at least where I can bring certain materials, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I, I don't know where to take it beyond this for the full story. Right. So that's just what I need to do in order to, um, almost like keep challenging myself right and that keeps it fresh too in a way you know right because um, i'm kind of always trying to figure out how to make that thing become what i envision in my head mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have you since we're dealing with this idea of you know the the conscious the conscious um work to express who you are, the work that you're doing, what your work is about. Um, in your experience has, obviously it seems like it's worked really well, um, your ability to break out and work with these different mediums. Has it ever been a situation that worked against you or people had, it had other expectations of what you would produce because they know you more as an artist or they relate more as, as an artist, more as a photographer, but they, and they relate more to that work than maybe something else? Um, I mean, it's interesting, like, I think it's, it's interesting and exciting in a way because there are shows that I've been asked to be in that are specifically photography shows. And I'm okay mm -hmm. with, you know, that, but I might, present the photographs on top of a wallpaper that I might use for an installation or for right. a collage. Right. So I still try and put my stamp on it. And I don't think all of the photographs need that. Um, but it is nice to hint at that just to kind of, I don't know, remind the viewer of like where I'm coming from as it connects to my story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Yeah. But, you know, I think it's, it's not like, I, 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 I don't always do a photograph. I don't always do one or the other, you know, it, it might just like whatever compels me or whatever the work needs is what I would, you know, right. I've done right. shows where I haven't done any photographs because I wanted to challenge myself to kind of create that story without having to have my physical body like present in the photographs. Right. Right. Um, I think that's a, that's, it's actually, this is kind of leading right into another question I had. I feel like you've, you've referenced a lot the concept of the crit and getting critiqued by professors. Um, and it obviously, I'm sure you could probably relay a lot of interesting stories and things that took place um, during crits at Yale. I think they have their own reputation, but what is, what is the value of, what has been the value of the crit um, for you to, to this point? And when we talk about criticism, I mean, the art world is built largely on, you know, the criticism of work, uh, you know, once it's professionally critiqued, um, written about, reviewed, all those things. So tell me a little bit for you how the experience was for crits at Yale, but how that has, how that has kind of influenced or been a part of your practice and how you continue to navigate that, the role of criticism. How is that, what has that been for you in your practice? Mm -hmm. I mean, criticism in my practice is a major tool, you know, to keep bringing the work beyond where it's been in the past. Right. Um, at Yale, it was, it was kind of joked about like if you had a good crit then that wasn't good for you because you right. didn't get anything from that you know or you know some people just won over the panelists better than others and I often wasn't one of those people winning anyone over mm -hmm. and I think it was because I didn't really know exactly what I was wanting to get at which I feel like I know better now. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't really have the words. I would just put the work up and then I was kind of sitting there not really knowing how to um, explain it or, um, you know, stick up for the work that I had created. Mm -hmm. But after a while, I realized that in the critiques, everyone's coming with their own experiences. And so when you're taking that critique in, if you can, you know, obviously you're having a conversation in part of that as part of that critique, but if you are also, you know, often I would have, we would have other students take notes for us so we could reference the things that were said um, and you're able to kind of build this kind of like way of sifting out the critique that doesn't actually really apply to you at all. It's more about the person that was saying it. Mm. And then the other stuff that really kind of polishes up where you're like, where you're not really speaking on the thing that you're getting or trying to get at, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I would say beyond graduate school, you don't have that critique in the same way. Um, so you have to kind of build up a community of people that you trust that will be honest with you, but that you also respect their, you know, what they're bringing to the table as it comes to aesthetics and just knowledge about the things that you're trying to get at right so that you can have a i mean i've had studio visits with friends where it felt like a little confrontational but it, you don't let it like push you over the edge 
to like being so defensive that you get to a place where you're like, oh, like I wouldn't have even got there if you didn't make me look at it that way. Right, right. And it's like, I've had times in my studio, like fairly recently where I was just like, I don't know where this piece needs to go. And just through a simple conversation with someone who's critiquing the work, you know, essentially, it's not in the same set of like bringing your work to class for the specific reason of having someone critique it. But um, you want to have someone's reaction. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what the critique is, you know, what is your reaction when you look at this? What are you seeing? You know, what's working? What are you thinking about? And if those things aren't lining up, then you want, you need to like kind of keep flushing out the ideas and working the materials in the way that you need to. Um, So I'm like, I'm open to it. I'm like, I feel, I like that kind of emotional journey that you're like defending your work, but then you're like, wait, I have to like let go a little bit so that I can like remove yourself from it a little bit so that you can are open to like critiquing it yourself as, as well as the person that's kind of sharing their, their thoughts on the thing, if that makes sense. Yeah. It seems like, well, I, I definitely believe that um, it is a process and a skill to be able to receive criticism and apply it constructively, not just to, you know, I mean, obviously you don't have any control. I think you're right there. Everybody's coming from a different place, different perspective, biases, all those sorts of things. But um, it seems like the criticism is pretty instrumental in the way that you move forward. So I think in the studio, but I'm curious about, not that I've ever seen any bad press on your work, but when you just, does that influence you now that you're in the professional realm and criticism is, is a, is a tad bit different. Um, Somebody doesn't even need to have gone to your studio. They go to your show, who knows how long they even spent with the work or who they spoke with. Does that, does that influence you at all or affect you at all when you may read something or, or talk to someone who is a critic of some sort, does that impact you or your practice at all? Yeah, I don't know if I let it impact my practice per se, but I think I've navigated through the world since day one at, under this like under critical eyes, I guess, you know, I feel like it's, it's just, um, and I, I, I was always really sensitive and I'm still pretty sensitive now, I guess, but, um, And I do get anxious to see what is written about, you know, if some, if someone were to write up about the work, but I'm also taking a lot of chances. And so there's a, like, there's a lot of question marks. Like I'm not even sure how things are going to be perceived. So I can learn through that criticism, you know? Mm -hmm. And if it feels way out of left field, then you can just be like that person really didn't get where I was going coming from and they're clearly coming from another angle and they wanted a platform to kind of address their angle or whatever they were kind of dealing with you know and as a writer and a critic they have the right to do that as well um but I feel like I get more out of the conversations which we might not call it critique but it's like the people that are experiencing the work firsthand if I get to be there and have those conversations with them in person that's the kind of critical information that I process to then know where to take the work next right right I'm not sure if I answered yeah and so two things then it's safe to say that the critique, the crit within the MFA program, it was, it was important to you and it has helped to shape the way that you 
receive criticism, the, the process, but then also I think it, it sounds as though um, it also gave you an opportunity and the practice to respond to it and kind of um, mitigate that sense of feeling uh, affected or, um, or I don't know, or, or whatever it is, but to be able to process that, to put it back into the work. I guess what I'm getting at, you know, I think there are different impressions of what criticism is and how you experience it. And it does take a lot to, I do believe that it is a process to be able to receive that and then apply that constructively. I can say for myself, when I was in studio, it did not work for me. <laughs> I'm way too sensitive. Like, it, you know, it's hard for me to separate that. But um, it's a different, it's, it's different for different people. But I still feel that there was a value to that process. And it's so And you don't that. always, you don't always feel like, I'm, I'm not trying to be like, oh, yeah, I always like, I live for critical feedback. It's just that, you know, I might have been crushed after a crit and been like, oh, that was awful. But then, you know, you let yourself just feel sad about it not going how you, you know, how you hoped. And then when you have a little bit of separation from the initial, you know, putting the work out there in front of these people. And a lot of times, like, we're working right up to the last minute. We haven't slept you know, and we're just trying to like put our best foot forward. But if it doesn't go that way, then you do need a little time to just be like, okay, remove yourself from that situation for a minute, for a minute and just be like, okay, I feel bad. But then, then you're able to kind of address it with fresh eyes and ears to just like know that there were some gems in there. And like, oh, I didn't even hear when they said that because I was only hanging up on like that one person who just really didn't get it, you know? Right. And so I, I don't want it to come across like I, I was like the champ at taking criticism. Um, you know, yeah. I would just start crying sometimes, but it was a lot to do with lack of sleep and just, you know, because we all want to like, we're all trying to get that praise. Right. It's school. We want to be, you know, the A student or whatever that looks like. Yeah. Um, but I, I think I was more interested in the fact that I had found at least a, a theme or the, several themes that I wanted to unpack that felt crucial just for me on an everyday basis. So I didn't want to switch what I was making work about. I just needed to like change how I presented that. Right. Until right. I got more of a handle on the materials I was using and the mediums I was working in. Right, right. Yeah. I don't know. Whenever I talk with art, you know, artists who are part of the emerging artist community, it always seems like it takes a little I, I feel like it is it's part of the process to understand that um a lot of it is just the ability to withstand like the marathon you know that that i think i don't know i always feel like this is the beginning of it it prepares you for it it's in a different way once you finish your mfa program or go into um the real art world but I don't think that it may just be a different context, but it's very much, it, it very much sets up the stage for how it is. Um, and I think that it is a skill that you develop, but it's something that's constant. It doesn't just go away. So it's interesting to see how, how big a role that that's played for you. Um, do you, do you, so if you were to talk to a young artist coming up, would you say that that is an important thing? Like, do you, give, do you try to give them that same sort of constructive criticism when they ask, is it, is it easy to give the criticism as well now as an artist? Yeah. Yeah. I think I kind of try and gauge the person before I feel like I can 
go in at a level that they're actually going to gain something from mm -hmm. a harsher critical mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll often follow that by saying, I wouldn't be telling you this if I didn't think that this work was already in a really strong place. And I wouldn't tell you this if I didn't think, you know, you were really dedicated to this. Right. Right. And I also say, and anything that doesn't really make sense to you or doesn't gel with what you're interested in, then you shouldn't use that information that I've given you. Like right. I'm, I try and tell them as I'm telling you um, for this discussion, like I, I walk them through that journey, you know? I try and leave them with that because I was there, I've been there, I'm still in that, you know? Right, right. Um, and I have people on my team that I, you know, I have to be, I still have to unpack something that someone said with them and, you know, you cry about it and you dust yourself off and you get back out, to, you know, get back out right. of the studio. <laughs> right. So with all of these... It also is, oh, sorry. No, it's also just like, not everyone is built for this particular way of being a creative, you know? Right. And so also listen to that, like maybe that's just not the, the avenue that your art practice is supposed to take and that's totally fine as well, do you know? Right, right. Um, you know, the way that we did in our first session, I want you to think about as we start to talk about this, you know, what, when we think of, when artists are thinking about their practice, is there anything for you um, and I don't know, maybe it was when you were in school or it could have, it could even be recent, but what's really important to you um, in terms of your practice and sustaining that practice? Like, is there advice that you give to, because it seems like it's a, it's, it can often be um, the best experience and the worst experience at the same time to be in studio and trying to come up with a body of work or finish something, a deadline. Um, what would be, what's your advice if someone comes up to you who is now introduced to this experience and doesn't know quite how to navigate or process that? Has there been anything that has helped you through that? I, you've, you've, give, you've given us a lot of good pieces, but what should we, what should our, what should our audience, our visitors come away with after this session when you think about practice in terms of advice? I mean, I, I guess I would have to like break it down in like different aspects or like different levels because I've gone on a journey and it's looked different throughout that journey. Right. Um, so like when you're in school and you have materials and you have access to people that want to give their opinions and their feedback like really cherish that because then all of a sudden you're out in the world and there's no one telling you to show up for anything and you have to be that person for yourself mm -hmm. and you have to kind of set those goals you you don't you no longer have the assignments you have to set your own goals you know mm -hmm. and what does that look like and um you know, early on, it was just me photograph, like, I, I was mostly just photographing when I first got to LA. So um, although I was, you know, people would say, Oh, so you're an installation artist. I was like, I don't know what that means. But okay. Um, but, you know, it's just like, you're working with what you've got. And then like, as I got a little more established, you get support from like the gallery hopefully if you if that's the path you take um and with the added support of the gallery you're able to make they're maybe able to invest in um how things are presented um it's kind of like just knowing that what you need is going to come to you when you need it as long as you're focused mm -hmm. on setting those goals and working towards achieving them Mm -hmm. yeah. And you might not always know what that's supposed to look like. Um, I feel like in our last talk, I, m I mentioned, you know, 
my focus was I always wanted, you know, I just was focused on going to Yale. And then after I achieved that goal, I didn't, I didn't visualize what the next thing was, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think I've slowly done that. I keep adding to that, but um, yeah, it's (laughs) like, it's a journey. And I think it just, knowing when to like be critical of yourself as much as others will be of you. Right. Like be your own, be your own critic at a certain point. Um, Right. Right. And, and having that, those handful of people that you trust, even if it's like your parents or your best friend or, you know, a a teacher that you kept in touch with, like, if you keep your, your, um, your lines of communication open with those people, they'll always they'll always be there for you. Don't take people for granted, you know, when you, when you kind of um, reach out after years of never talking to someone, that's a little harder to get people (laughs) to be there for you, but. (laughs) Right, I think that's across across the board, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've probably done that too, but I try to keep it, you know, keep the people that um, have helped me along the way. Um, and that I trust and value their feedback and I don't always like their feedback. You know, it's like, you have to know that if you care about the person and they care about you, that they're, you know, they're only going to say the things that they think are going to help, um, push you in a positive way. Right. Um, you know, looking at this particular image and, all of the work involved, and I don't know to what extent you may have had to, but like, have you, or do you outsource tools, labor, all that sort of stuff? Does that ever come up and is that necessary? How does that work? Yeah. So over time, again, like I've been able to, as my practice grows and I, um, you know, my income grows, then I'm able to outsource. Um, mm-hmm. And even before that, if I couldn't, you know, put the money up front, then the gallery might, you know, take a chance and be like, okay, I'll cover that. And hopefully it sells. But oh, yeah. Um, and that's as simple as like uh, framing a photograph with, you know, with glass and a frame, you know? Uh-huh. Right. Um, all of those images on there are tacked up except for the one of my parents, which was a found frame and it had the glass in it. I think the first show I had in LA, I didn't have any glass on any of the images. It was just all found frames. Okay. Um, but like when I was in school, I pretty much used like found materials. All those shoes were shoes that I had previously owned. And then, you know, using kind of, everyday objects that you could get at Home Depot or at a craft store or or kind of the things that I used. Um, But now I have a wider, a wider like net to cast. So like I can, um, I can have an assistant, you know, I can pay an assistant to help me with my photo shoots. Um, I can pay a studio manager to like make sure I'm showing up to things and emails are getting sent. Um, I can, I can have an idea to create an object with materials I'm not familiar with working with, but I can outsource someone that knows how to work with those materials and they can create my vision. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's, I'm sure there's like a lot of conversation about like ownership and like people that have their work made by other people. Um, but there are aspects of my work that I, I really just like having all of like my hands only doing the work, you know, I'm at a point where I'm like, I really need that thing to exist in the world. But if I don't know how to do it, then it's okay if I don't physically make it because it wouldn't come to fruition if I didn't put that idea out, you know, or no, give the kind of 
map of what it should be. Um, right. But um, I'm sitting here with like a pile of roses that I've cut out um, from this particular book that I'm just, uh -huh. you know, often my studio manager will be like, is there someone that you can, you know, hire to help cut out things? And I'm like, <laughs> just in, 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 the, in the sense of like having things just go a little faster in some cases, but cutting out materials is really therapeutic for me. And I also, it's almost like a way of me memorizing what I have access to when I go back to create the thing later. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I do outsource. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, you outsource, but you have the choice to do that now where if it were the, if it were a question of being able to actually fabricate that concept or that idea, you could do that now. I think that that is an important part, but I mean, I think it, it always is. I mean, there's a whole philosophy behind the concept and, you know, that is something that's, um, you know, that is, that is critical when you, when you think about, oh, I have to tell you a story that is so funny because I do think that it is quite therapeutic. Those are cut out very meticulously, by the way, which says to me that it's something that you definitely enjoy. And I remember somebody telling me that they saw you at a party and you were sitting at the kitchen table collaging while everybody else was doing their thing. And I was like, that's Genevieve Gayard. I totally get that. You know, I think there is a, there is something about the process and for you, it is those pieces. And it, it sounds like even if you could pay someone, there's something, there's some sort of, you know, gratification and enjoyment you get from that. And I think that's a distinguishing, um, yeah. you know, part. Anyway. <laughs> feel connected to those things. And it's also a little bit of like, it's like I can get some work done. Like when I'm in LA, there's it feels like there's always some event to go to or right. someone's, you know, having a gathering at their house. Right. So if I'm in the middle of production, then I'm like, okay, I, if I have to show up to this thing, then I need to be productive at the same time. Right. But it's also a nice tool for me to like, um, I'm a little socially awkward. Like it depends on like if it's a bigger crowd, I, I get a little bit shy and I'm like, I don't really know. I'm not a conversation starter. So I'll just kind of sit there and it'll draw people in to even talk to me about the work. And like, I can go on a conversation about the work, but right. um, yeah, it's just like, it's almost like my security blanket too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's a beautiful thing, you know? Um, so when you, so you talked a little bit about as your career progresses, so two questions for you. I'm sure there is a necessity for a support team or network, but there's also probably, or I don't know, tell me, like, do you find that there is a um, need for um, a support team that is not part of your profession? Like, you know, your support system, the people who make up the friends, the colleagues, the the other artists that help to feed you or support you as you go through this journey in addition to, and that's, and I'm sure those people have changed, not, I don't mean in a way, obviously, that you've dropped some people as you, but I mean, that it has <laughs> changed, because we know you wouldn't do that, that you would actually find that you're expanding that network, but I suspect that that is probably a necessary part for you to, you know, sustain yourself and feed yourself and create all of those new opportunities for different critics in your circle, but then also there is the professional network or support system. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I feel like my circle is pretty, like I know a lot of people and I'm friendly with a lot of people, but like my top 10 people that are on like my call list, you know, it's, it's pretty much, I have my few friends from high school that are still 
there, you know, like I have like a few people throughout each school I've gone to that I like kind of keep in my um, circle. Um, but when I think of like being in LA, like my world of my art world is like, it's got my family, my friends who are also the patrons and, you know, the, the dealers that are selling the work. And so it's, it's not that separate for me until I come back home where like, I'm very removed, like, or the people here are very removed from the art world. Right. So they're all like still connected to me, but it's like almost two different worlds. Right. And there's like this little bit of like joking of like, oh, you like left the small town and, you know, they, they use the word famous, which I kind of laugh and roll my eyes at, but because um, I wouldn't really say that, but I it's cute because they're just like, oh, you're, we love that you came back, like that you still come back and you're just pretty much the same, do you know? Tell me about that, although I guess we're going to talk a little bit more about that in our next session, but um, yeah, you came back you come back, you seem to feel really comfortable and you're practicing here. You're, you know, you're in Wendell doing your thing. Yeah. Um, did you, did you miss that when you were in LA and now that you're here, is there a certain feeling? Are there certain things that you miss about your studio space in LA? How is that? How is that working? I mean, I have way more space in LA, uh, but like the it's there's no nothing is insulated there so whatever temperature it is outside it's the same temperature <laughs> inside my studio <laughs> so that's a little bit of a you know bummer but yeah um it's it's been like I you know when people write about me they're often like oh LA art LA based artist because that's kind of like where most of my practice is but I feel like I've always been more bi coastal um when I, whenever I felt really stuck at the beginning of a project, my kind of go-to move would be to like fly back home to try and do something that just felt like more comfortable, like less judgment in a way. Yeah. And I think that that's what I got from being in Wendell. Like I could be just as wacky and weird. Um, and no one's, you know, there might be an occasional like long glance out of a truck driving by, but you know, nothing like, no one made me feel like I wasn't welcome here. Right. And so I feel like I've always had that feeling. Even when I was at Yale, I would drive the two hours from New Haven to come back and make work in right. Wendell, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's always kind of been that heartbeat. Um, and when I was growing up and when I was in high school, um, I had a few friends that lived in Wendell, but I didn't know it as well. And I just was like always wanting, I was, I would get mad at my parents. Like, why did you bring us to this small town to like raise us? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was really emo about it. And I spent most of my time in my room just, yeah. yeah. So but I think now I appreciate it. Like once you get a new perspective on the world, then you can, I mean, I, I also like see like the flaws of, from, of the place that I grew up in, but I use that more of like as fuel for my work and like know that my work kind of has a mission to kind of reach more people. Mm -hmm. And not specifically to Wendell, but just like even New England, if you will, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's always been like the place that I, I come back to. So, yeah. yeah. And even if, I don't know if I had mentioned this last talk, but I was once asked like if you could live anywhere. And I was just like, oh, Wendell, because then I can still travel, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think um, that must be, I think that probably must be 
a, or is for a lot of artists a challenge, especially when you're trying to establish yourself, the idea that if you had your choice, you would probably much rather stay where you were, but in order to make a name for yourself and do the, do the work that you have to move to a metropolitan art center. And mm -hmm. that takes a lot of balancing, which I'll ask you more about next time. So when you, when you, when I look at all of these, we talked about outsourcing things, um, you know, I'm sure this compared to maybe one of your last installations is probably much smaller or, you know, the scale is different. And so as you get, as you do these things and you progress, um, we know about now your support team that helps you in terms of, you know, morale and motivation. But tell me a little bit about how it grew when you realized you were required because of, you know, your work being in more demand and more recognition, having to expand your professional team. What is that for you? What does that look like? And who are the people that make that up? My professional team is my gallery, my studio manager, and like my PR person. <laughs> I would was say. that weird to feel, was that weird to feel like you needed that now? Was that like a what? Or was that like, oh, okay, now I need, I mean, was it, how did you know? And I would also maybe add my studio assistant too. Cause off, like when I'm in LA and I'm in production, then I also have a studio assistant. How did you know to do that? How did you know what you needed and where to go? And how do you do that? It's like, I think you have to be a really good listener <laughs> mm -hmm. because I don't want to sound hokey, but I'm really like one of those, like the universe will bring the people into your life that you really need, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but even they could be there and you might not acknowledge it because you're not listening or paying attention. Mm -hmm. But um, my studio manager actually worked for an artist that was on the panel at Yale and was traveling with that artist. So okay. I connected with her because I'd have to go pick up the visiting artist at the train station. Ah, and I was like, you okay. can, you can throw my, you can throw your stuff in my, in my, you know, my studio. Um, and that was over the course of maybe five weeks. I'm not really sure how long that was, but um, enough of a connection was made that we just exchanged information, year, you know, a year, uh, I guess two or three years later, I ran into her in LA, she was leaving LA, but we connected again. My studio manager lives and works out of Detroit. So we don't even have to be in the same state. Like, but yeah. I remember reaching out to her specifically just because I had a question about something that was happening with my gallery at the time. And I didn't even know if she'd remember who I was. And she was just, like, yeah, and it seems like you're doing a lot. Sounds like you might need somebody. And I was like, whoa, I wasn't calling for that. I didn't think that was what I needed, you know? Right. Um, and she kind of agreed to just be like available for a little while just to see if it would see, you know, like kind of right. a trial. Uh-oh, did we lose Genevieve? She'll come back. Did I not come back? Oh, there you are. Sorry. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I would have filled in with like a TikTok dance or something. <laughs> so I don't know if you heard me, but I was just saying like, I couldn't do this. I've, I got to a point very early on. I was like, I don't think I could do this without her. Um, one day I walked into my studio or into my roommates, my studio mate and my roommates studio. And it was super clean. And I was like, this looks amazing. Who was in here? And he was, he was like, oh, one of my former students, she's amazing. And I was like, and I think he was kind of going back and forth. He had a couple people helping him in the studio and he could only manage having one person. And I was like, well, if you're not going to use her, maybe I could. <laughs> um, and so 
she's been a dream to work with as well. She just kind of goes in my studio. And again, like when I'm in my studio, I'm mostly working on my collage works and gathering materials for installations. So those are kind of the things I like to do on my own, but she has a really great eye. So she knows how to like organize things in a way that they're displayed that I can kind of see everything. And, you know, it's sometimes it's nice to just have someone in the space while you're working. You both are working on something, you know. Um, and I've had, a, I've been on a journey with a few different galleries, um, which we'll probably get into a little bit more next nice. time. But um, I'm at a really great gallery and I feel supported and I feel heard and, um, you know, work is selling. So as far as my team that's yeah that's it. and I mean I'm not even like mentioning I mean I guess I could make you know at a certain point I I have friends that are collectors that are also people that got me on track with like my financial stuff because a lot of artists one minute they're you know, living paycheck to paycheck and the next minute they're just like, I don't know what to do with this money. I don't, you know, and a lot of us have um, school loans and, you know, bills that maybe are past due and whatnot. So it's like, there's a part of like catching up to do. There's a part of, of like investing in yourself. There's a part of like um, putting aside retirement, like all of those things that I didn't really know anything about or think anything about until I kind of got clued in. But again, the right person being there and reaching out and saying, you know, if you need help with this, I can help you. Right. right. And not everyone's open to that. So they might miss out on that opportunity, but I kind of, I've tried to just be open to the, um, the people that have come in in a positive way into my life. Right. And, right. and utilize them and, you know, give back in, in the ways that I can. Right. Right. Yeah. I just, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Cause I think there's, uh, there's sometimes a mystique around it. Like it just, you know, it, 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 a, it's not the same for everyone, but there are things and people that you need and sometimes it requires you to seek them out. Sometimes they may come to you, but to understand as you evolve and grow, so will the needs that you have and how you address those as an artist, um, I think are important to, to really think about. Um, because, you know, again, going through this journey, this, this marathon, it would be hard to sustain it by yourself. But sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So you just enlighten some people about, you know, what might be coming down the pike and you, you know, because there's, it's like, oh, you got it made, you're all set. And it's like, well, it takes a lot of work and I would not be able to sustain it all by myself. There are people who work with you to support and make sure that you, you know, you are, are taken care of so that you can do the work that you're being asked to do. Um, my, my, um, and I feel like I could sustain it, but it would, it would look very different. Right. And right. I think part of my goal is to continue to evolve and have the work evolve and get stronger and, you know, bigger and better. Right. It doesn't mean necessarily scale, but, you know, I just, when you have that support team, then you have, like, it's almost like your imagination gets even more loose, you know? Right. Right, you're able to think about and focus on the things that you need to in order to create, rather than having to manage all those other things that um, could not necessarily prohibit, but could definitely limit what you're able to do. Because I think, yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, I'm just saying like, I know there's things that I've had like on the back burner and I was like, oh, I can't do that now because X, Y, or Z. Um, and that I've, uh, like, I eventually got to create over the time, you know, right. as, as I grew and as I, um, had the right people kind of come into my path. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think also, um, 
just just an understanding too i think you you know there is a lot of knowledge out there um and there is a lot that um you know that artists have to kind of go through in order to really see to see how how this profession relies a lot on you as an individual and your ability your ability to manage um, and I'm sure financially, um, you know, has a lot to do with it. There are a lot of different choices that you have to make. Um, and I and I think that, um, you know, as you said, one minute you might not be doing that great, but, you know, another minute suddenly you have the resources and you don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have all of the knowledge to, to best to, you know, to benefit from that. Um, and sometimes it's hard to ask for help, I think, too. But I think that the fact that you were talking about listening and always being open to that, that's important. Sometimes I feel a lot of times, um, you know, I will talk to artists and either they feel like, yeah, I got this. No, but I can, I don't worry. I'm okay. Or um, just a sense of how priorities work um, that if you plan on sustaining this for a long time, you need to kind of organize and plan it out. Um, yeah. And I just don't feel that that necessarily is done on your own. When you think about the work that you have have been able to make now and the success that you've had and the projects that you've been offered and completed and all these things, I'm sure it's hard, but are there any standout works for you that you <laughs> share with us or think would be, you know, or any, I don't know. I mean, it could have been a project that. Yeah, I was going to scroll through. So this is kind of like a slide okay. show that I usually use in my talk. Yeah. But I'll stop on something if it feels okay. like, but this is a little bit of like the journey of kind of like, when I first was in LA, I didn't know anyone. So I, I'd have to photograph out on the street mostly, you know? I love that one. Uh, That's one of my faves. I love that one too. I, guess I would stop here as like a crucial um, show. I'm gonna, I think I have two slides of this space. Yeah. So those were two, those two images were actually like across from each other. Like the, the spaces are one. Okay. Um, this was okay. the spring break art show. Okay. And I was reminiscing with a friend and saying how it's, it's cool when someone will be like, Oh, I remember like the first time I saw your work was at spring break. And I'm like, that makes me feel really good because I, Felt like this particular installation just really was a phenomenal experience to be part of, to create, to kind of be there in the space as people were coming in. And I think that was one of the first times of just seeing like how such a diverse group of people respond to the same things and that kind of vibrating in this space of like if we're so different then how come we can all be cool in this space you know mm -hmm. um and just like people of all ages were experiencing it so um and that it was it touched people in enough way to like bring it up when they see work that i've done more recently right to reference it tell me about your use like so I know that you said that a lot of the materials that you use are found materials, but like that installation, like where do you find, where do you go? Where do you find these? Where do you, how? I mean, I'm dropping a lot of knowledge on you guys, but I'm not going to tell you where I get all my stuff. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't worry, I will get it out of her and share it with you later. <laughs> no, I mean, I... I've found places that I source um, vintage wallpaper. The last, the last um, installation was already existing wood paneling, but it played in with my thesis show. Um, 
my mom has always been a person that has a lot of, you know, objects. She, she collects slash hoards a lot of things. And um, so that's kind of the environment I grew up in. So I think the installations become a lot about organizing the clutter. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of details, but each thing has its moment and you can, you know, appreciate it. Um, so are that's kind any, of like my own. I'm sorry. I just had to ask, cause I see photos, like are any of the photos that you use your own photos or anything, things that actually belonged to you that you put in your installations? Um, no. Not necessarily, like it might be something that I remember or, you know, it or, you know, makes me think of a certain time. But other times, you know, when you're thrifting and looking for things, you land on things that you didn't even know you were going to see or find. And so it's kind of awesome to like have that moment of like, oh my God, this is such a cool uh, like object or item and now I can kind of share this and put it on display and a lot of times when I'm out you know shopping especially like I was in Chicago a while back with my studio manager and I was just like okay we're getting stuff for this installation but this particular piece I'm keeping for myself you know like I would I would have moments where I'd find stuff for myself but almost nine out of ten times that object ends up being in an installation <laughs> right and i'm right. like oh i have to let that go but <laughs> so do you is that is part of the part is part of obviously part of this is actually finding the work is that like like you know okay we're gonna spend two days i'm making this up but two days we're going shopping and we're going here we're gonna find we're looking for these things or is it i'm gonna give myself a week and i'm gonna see what I find or how, how does that work when you actually shop for it? And do you enjoy it? Cause you seem like you do. Yeah. Sometimes it's overwhelming, but I've found a few places, especially in LA that I can go specifically to and just be like, yep, that's the palette. That's the item. That's the thing. Like, um, but for this image that I'm showing you here, and even with the spring break, this is from cam, the California African American museum show I had. Um, these a lot of times people need something they can't see what you're visualizing and you know they're putting in money and yes they've invited you to be part of this but they need some reassurance of what this thing might look like even though it doesn't exist yet so i then have to, it basically starts with finding wallpaper um these particular installations had exteriors too so they look like the outside of houses what are that what do those look like um so kind of just getting a palette and like making what i call vision boards of like what i would kind of like or envision the space to look like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they know that it may or may not look exactly like that but that's my hope and a lot of times it ends up looking pretty close to that because it at least helps me even like visualize better what I'm looking for but right. I mean I know I got that bed off Craigslist um, <laughs> and I got that exercise bike from an estate sale um, I got the carpeting and um, tiling floor from linoleum city <laughs> you know, it's like the coming from all over. That isn't, those are brand new, you know, like some things, the thing about LA, a lot of those um, materials, um, I guess, get used for, you know, sets and whatnot for television. And so mm -hmm. there are some more unique items that I have access to. And, you know, sometimes I'm not, if I'm also, you know, photographing and I have to be certain places to do other parts of the work, I have to do a lot of shopping online. And so I'm scrolling on eBay and Etsy. Right. And so there's no real specific um, starting place except for right. kind of getting a rough idea of the palette. And, right. um, you know, for this, it was, these are two different spaces that were side by side, but thinking about a personal like kind of private space with the bedroom and the bathroom, and then this more communal space with the kitchen and living room. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So those are the, like, that's how my mind starts to like categorize things so that I can kind of work on them separately, right. but at the same time. Right. Do, do you feel like, I mean, what, obviously they play an important role, the, the materials that you use and you find and you buy and how you actually construct these spaces. Um, do you feel like, uh, at one point I think we talk like there is a language that you're developing with these materials or that maybe many artists create their own, develop their own sort of language, but explain, explain to me if you feel that that's what your materials do and how. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is actually, this show um, showcases that, I think, in a, in a strong way. Um, I obviously use the colors black and white as, like, a reference to moi. Right. And then I, <laughs> and then I also, I'm really interested in this more, like, retro pastel palette. Um, I use it, and I can say this now, I don't know if I knew this early on, but like I use it as this way to kind of draw in the viewer. Mm -hmm. um, and in the sense of like, it feels comforting, it feels warm and inviting. But once they get in there, there's enough information that it's it starts to unpack some things that are a little harder maybe to talk about. So it, in part of using that as my language, it's, it's like a tool it's to kind of, um, to lure, to lure you in, like mm -hmm. make it look like candy, make it look familiar, make it look like grandma's house. <laughs> the works, you know? the works, there are two things that I think about some of the collage work that you've done um, on wallpaper with, but with the different images that you've taken out of, I think you said even magazines, like black magazines or using black fashion models, things like that. And they even fabricated the, um, those little like porcelain figures, you had those created. Like that to me, because at first glance, I thought, oh my gosh, where did she find those? But to, ha to know exactly what you wanted and how they would look, Tell me a little bit about, about that, you know, because when you said lure you in, because that's what your collage work does. Like, you're like, oh, that's so, oh, you know, you're like, oh, like, <laughs> you know, and that, yeah. that is kind of, I think, um, conceptually what is so strong for you. Exactly. You know, if you're, if you're on the other side of your gallery and you see this at first, you're like, oh, look at that. That is just lovely. You know, and you become, and then you're like, <laughs> you know, you, those things. Yeah. But how you've like transformed these things that at first glance are, you know, quite mild, but then suddenly, yeah, your language comes out. Yeah. So I think, you know, with the cam show, a lot of, things had happened, a lot of that work was built out of a tragedy that happened in my family. My niece passed away in a house fire while I was actually at Spring Break Art Fair. So there, and I tell you this to kind of show you like, I'm an artist that's working from tragedy, turning that into something that is um, you know, it's therapeutic. It's maybe not obvious that it's about what I'm going through. It's, I'm still creating work that allows for a larger audience. Um, my niece's middle name was Rose. So the roses instantly became that one part of my language mm -hmm. that is consistent in a lot of words, in the, in the wallpaper decisions. Um, mm -hmm. In this particular piece that I have up on the screen, you know, I go in there and I stain the wallpaper um, 
so the the flowers are almost weeping um and i can like i can remember like a certain stage of like what was going on when this was created mm -hmm. um the the apartment that i moved into in la which is where i live now like early on when i moved in there the the neighbor, the house next door to us also caught on fire so i had this kind of feeling like fire or kind of these tragic things related to fire were kind of always close by in your space and yeah. i don't know how it happened but um a piece of debris or wood from the burnt house from the neighbors had gotten on our side of the fence mm -hmm. it was just a charred piece of wood basically and i don't know what compelled me to do this but i i gathered that and put it in a bag and i started to use the charcoal of that you know that wood that charred wood as a way to kind of go in on this piece and you know stain it and um yeah right but it, you know the staining it, it's supposed to reference you know like something has happened here um but at the same time it's it's a less intense reference to just like growing up in an old house with um the radiators that if you don't tighten the the key, then the steam will then kind of create this staining as well on the walls, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and I grew up in a house with different, you know, vintage wallpaper, and so it's like when I was kind of dealing with and processing the passing of my niece, like you can see those gestures come out more intensely. Right. Is what I'm getting at, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, I might revisit those things off and on, and sometimes I might not. Um, I'm just kind of skipping through some of these slides so we can get to a, a couple other um, collage works. Here's another installation. Okay, here's a figurine. We'll talk about that for a second because right. you've done okay. that. Yeah. So um, we talked about how I, you know, thrift a lot, and in my thrifting and antique shopping, I I came across these um, figurines called Royal Daltons. Mm -hmm. It's you know a porcelain white figure woman in a ball gown of sorts, mm -hmm. and. Um, I was just like, oh, wow, this is like a thing. People collect these. Right. And, and then I'm also coming across um, the salt and pepper shaker mammies. And it's kind of becoming clear to me that there's these two representations of females or womanness and they're drastically different. They're drastic. They're treated drastically different. Um, and so I came up with this idea, like, how would, how could I mash them up, you know? Mm -hmm. But this is a great example of, I don't work with porcelain. I don't work in ceramics. Um, but I work with a fabricator. I bring the two found objects that heads are removed from each figurine mm -hmm. the mammy head then goes on the body of the girl in the dress she's then seamlessly put back together and then repainted um kind of addressing all of those issues that um the mammy kind of has you know mm -hmm. um and not having the black female be stuck in this um this position of servant and um bring her story beyond that because it has it has come way beyond that and um, continues to go beyond that um the holes are still left in the top of the head mm -hmm. to 
you know, acknowledge that the past um, and the history of this, but at the same time, you know, the, the head wrap is added to, because all of those details that are um, paid attention to on the Royal Daltons are completely ignored when it comes to like the salt and pepper shakers. Right, right. Um, I, I feel like, and um, they oh, go ahead. Oh. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say like, I, they, I set them up in different scenarios. So like she, this particular one was in the living room at the show in New Orleans, which was one of the slides prior. Um, and she's actually looking up at these printouts of the, the layout of the slave ships, which were like circling the parameter of the room. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like a play on words, you know, with things are looking up, but she's looking up at this thing that is a direct like lineage to her past. Right. There's a good um, image where you can see where those uh, slave ships were kind of circling I, the ceiling there. Wow, that is a huge space to have. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you? Well, two things. One is as our time goes down, we do have one student that has joined us, one MCLA student, Leo, who is a second year uh, student in arts management and also an English major. And he has a, um, a question that I would love to share with you before, um, before we end. So I am okay. going to put him back on um, back on video, if I can, and have him chat with us. Hey, Leo. Hello. How's it going? Uh, great, that was really awesome to, um, <laughs> that was really awesome to, yeah, that was really awesome to hear. See. All oh, Genevieve. Thank you, I was, I was thinking that at one point, I was like, oh my gosh, Leo's here and we're just like rambling on, like. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. Um, um, I mean, Erica got, you know, my two questions that I had submitted prior. She kind of uh, weaseled them into her interview, but I did come up with um, another question that I would like to ask. Um, if you could describe your practice in one word, what would that word be? Mm. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> He's good, Genevieve. He's good. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll just say the first thing that came to mind, which is just a journey. Um, I guess that's sort of two words, journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you were you know? mentioning, you were, you talked a little bit about how, you know, um, navigating the art world is a journey, and I'm sure you'll talk about that more next time. Um, but, you know, navigating the art art world is a journey, but also, I guess, navigating your practice is a journey. Is that what you mean? Like, sort of figuring out your style and how you want to present your artwork? Yeah, but also just not having, like, a clear understanding or clear idea of what this journey that I'm on looks like. And through each work, it kind of unfolds a little bit more. So um, openness, I think, would also be another like keyword that just kind of could expand on that. And the sense of like just having an open mind of like where this can all go and all types of people that will um, kind of experience this work whether it'll take them in a positive way or a negative way you know I don't 
I can't always um, gauge how people are going to react to the work, but I hope it like has a shift in the way people kind of pursue on their journey. Yeah, and um, a follow-up question to that actually. Um, do you have any advice um, for students in the Fine and Performing Arts Department at MCLA? Um, just in general, it doesn't have to be about anything in particular. Um, I think it's just like, when you're there, just like fully be in the moment and take advantage of the resources and the people that are there. And again, like all these different people are coming into our path, like for a specific reason and just listening to yourself and trusting your gut in terms of like, is that person here to help or hinder me? You know, cause you can always, if that person isn't working in your, in, on your journey, then you can always kind of um, let that go. But it's harder to kind of really key into the people that are there to kind of bring you to the next level. Um, if that makes sense and if it's yeah. helpful. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Leo is keeping us uh, on <laughs> here. I, I think um, <laughs> as, we, as we wrap up, um, I promised Genevieve that there is a question I would always ask her before we were done. And the rose and the thorn, the good thing that happened to mm. the rose and the thorn that may have not been but yet she persevered. What is that for today, Genevieve? Um, the rose, honestly, today was like having this conversation. It's interesting because it's, because I, I'm here by myself pretty much. So this is like a way to like interact in a way. So it feels good, like, oh, I'm still relevant. People want to hear what I have to say. <laughs> um, so that's always good. So thank you guys for having me for this. Um, and the thorn is the pile of dishes that I have to <laughs> wash after, <laughs> after all of this so that I can cook another meal. <laughs> yeah, we hear you. You know what? If it wasn't for quarantine, Leo and I would be there. We would help you, but sorry. <laughs> How about you? How about you, Leo? As a oh. participant, what's your rose and thorn, friend? Well, um, I don't know. It was, it was really, uh, for a rose, it was, you know, really cool to come on here and be a panelist, which is kind of weird. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not the expert or anything, but... <laughs> Um, um, that's pandering. I can name a different rose, but, um, uh, and then, you know, a thorn would maybe be uh, a little bit of connection issues, you know, just like, just a little bit of lag. Um, but you know, that's not a big deal. So. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, as we rely on this technology and all that's going on, there are hiccups, but I really appreciate, obviously, Leo, you participating, Genevieve, you being here with us, and you're coming back with us next week, and we're so excited, and I, I think the rose for me, too, is having this interaction. The thorn is that I wish that we could be in person and here at the gallery and be able to see and experience Genevieve's work, but I think that will come. We just have to be patient, and in the meantime, we have these opportunities, so I really appreciate both of you for being here and everyone that's watched. And um, I hope that you'll come back with us next week. Um, and I think that this is the perfect image to finish with, which is called, she's so articulate. She is, isn't she? She's articulate. She is. <laughs> the only thing is, I did say you missed this last week, Leo, but Genevieve yeah. is coming live from her car and she's not doing that this time. But it was great because she <laughs> some really good tunes, but unfortunately now she can't do that. So we'll have to go for the next one, Genevieve. But other than that, again, oh my, oh, I totally forgot about that. I know. 
Um, everybody that's helped us do this, I have to say, and I will say that I'm glad Genevieve shared with us her support team because Erin, her studio manager, helps us out greatly. Veronica, our manager here at Gallery 51, she helps us out greatly. So it takes a team. I'm not going to say it, you know, that dream work, teamwork thing, but it is true. So with that, thanks everyone. This, these clips will be available hopefully sometime next week. So we'll keep everybody updated with that. But in the meantime, we'll look forward to seeing Genevieve next Wednesday again from 5 to 6.30. And Leo, I hope you join us again. We look forward to seeing you in person at some point. Of course. Yeah. All right, everybody. Have a great right. rest of the evening. I would sing, but I have a horrible voice. So, all right. Take care. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Yes.